Okay, let's get started. So good morning everyone again um, and welcome to the April 2014 edition of the Volunteer Match Solutions Best Practice Network webinar series, Transformative Value Evolve. So before we get started, I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping items. Um, so there are a few different ways that you can ask questions. The first is by typing them into the box on the right side of your screen, and the second is by submitting them through Twitter by tweeting them to at VM underscore solutions using the hashtag VMBPN. So as usual, we are going to... taking some breaks to make sure you keep them coming in throughout the whole morning. And last but not least, uh, a copy of the presentation as well as a link to the recorded webinar will be circulated to everybody afterwards, so you will get all of this information as follow-up. So this morning, we are going to be joined by Chris Jarvis, who is the co-founder of Realized Worth. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Realized Worth, they're one of the leading agencies out there that works with companies on engaging their employees in corporate citizenship programs. So Chris is really well known in the space for his thought leadership in things like employee volunteering, workplace concept of transformative value, which is something that he's been sharing with audiences at different events throughout the year and also through the Realized Worth blog. So most recently, Chris presented on this topic at the Charities at Work conference in New York, which took place earlier this month, um, and just kind of a, a morning webinar. I take the opportunity this morning to get up to speed and get the inside scoop on transformative value today. So when Chris and I were talking about the session this morning, and he was teaching me what transformative value is, one of the things that really stuck out to me and, and what I think is so important and what you'll see here today is that it really goes beyond just your basic employee engagement, which we all know that having an engaged workforce is important. Um, the research is out there to support that. But it, this kind of takes it a step further and really goes into fostering a cultural belief system within individuals, and as a result, within a company that can then I think before we're going to be breaks in between each section um, to pose your questions. So again, make sure you keep them coming in. Um, but first, we're going to get started with a little bit of history and go through an overview of blended and shared value. And then we'll move into answering the question of what transformative value is and how it fits into and works with um, blended and shared value. And then we'll wrap up by taking I'm going to welcome Chris to the call and go ahead and hand the presentation over to him to get us started. Good morning, Chris. Are you there? I am. How are you doing, Lauren? Welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good to be here. I uh, just tried to send a note to everybody to say, hey, glad to be here. And Lauren, you're the only person you saw. <laughs> I got it. Oh, so yes, Chris says she's so glad to be here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, she, she's backing me up. Yeah, no, this is great. I'm glad to be here with everybody. Um, so, yeah, let's get started. Uh, or the question screen and um, wow that sounds interesting I have no idea what it means or wow that's kind of cool but I have no idea how it applies to me or well wait a minute have you thought about this or maybe you're going to be the rare person who just says uh, this makes total sense and it's my experience and feel free screen talking to, into a mic and I can't see anybody so this is like the worst form of human communication known to man but um, it'll be fun and uh, we get to watch the screen move around so as Lauren uh, said if um, if you don't know who the guy is that's talking to you right now my name is Chris Jarvis and I am one of the founders of Realize Worth we focus on getting people to show up for citizenship programs so we obsess about what motivates people, how do you ring their bell, how do you reward people, what happens when people volunteer.
things, if employee develops teamwork, if it encourages people to be generous and share knowledge, why? Why, do, why does any of that happen? It, 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 is it because people, when they volunteer, they magically become a better person? Or uh, are they touched by an angel in some way? Like, what actually is going on here? So w we think about it. We read about it. We talk about it. Practitioners' virtual team for like a year to get the thing up and going, find the right people, and make it happen. So, just to give you a sense of this is our constant obsession. We love what we do uh, because we think that when people get out there and get an opportunity to do this kind of work, they become um, the best version. Or they have the opportunity to become the best version of themselves. So, if you're listening and you're a volunteer, or or a giver, or somebody who on a regular basis you know, participates in what we call, in the broadest sense, pro-social behavior, you know what I'm talking about. In a volunteering program, I do not know what's going on. Um, just hang on. Hold on, it'll come to you, uh, but really the experience is what drives the knowledge. So let's jump in. We're going to talk um, about transformative value, um, and it's where we do that. But so um, most organizations fail to execute strategy. Okay, so I can say that, and then you're wondering, well, wait, why are you saying that? Various sources have reported that implementation failure rates are about uh, 60 to 90 percent. So that, that's pretty significant, right? And uh, that, that actually comes from these two guys, Norton and Kaplan. They wrote the Strategic Balance Scorecard. It's a great book. Most of your companies are using some version of a scorecard or balance scorecard. Their observation based on the Boston Consulting Group and other prestigious organizations that looked at companies, strategies, and implementation success. So it's somewhere between 60 to 90 percent of all the work we do around strategy fails. So why is that? What happens that these very smart people who are highly motivated We'll put together of this next quote by this very famous person. If you don't know who Peter Drucker is, this is a, a, an older photo of him. But uh, he said this very uh, insightful thing, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Strategy is incredibly important. You can't skip it. You can't go around it. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to do this. Um, but your culture will eat strategy for breakfast every single time. And a strategy on paper can look great and have all the you know T's crossed and I's dotted. It's line manager, mid-level manager. And if they don't understand it, if they don't believe it, if they don't have a way of making sense, there's this whole theory around sense making, if they can't make sense of it, in terms of why it has value, it will die. It just that's it's those people right there. Okay, so there's this built-in limiter as to the success of strategies like shared value. So let's step back for a minute. I want to talk. I want to show you a bit of a progression from a concept known as blended value to shared value to this thing called transformative value. And then we're going to tie that all together as Lauren said, and we're going to think through, okay, what are the, what are the five phases through which a company evolves until it gets to this place of transformative value, which I will submit. It speaks to the success of the strategy itself. Does that make sense? Okay. If it doesn't make sense, make a note of it, and we will come to it in a, in a moment here. Okay. You can ask the question. Okay. Let's talk about value to begin with. 
I should say this is a Prezi. It moves around a lot. If you feel yourself getting motion sickness, just stop looking at the screen. Look a little. Every single day, all of us, uh, we are constantly facing choices and we're making uh, value judgments. And here's how, what that looks like. Um, we ask three basic questions. Is this worth the expense of energy, time, and resources? This choice that I have in front of me, okay? Is the risk, the, what is the risk involved? Okay, whatever kind of risk that may be. And what about the loss of missed opportunities? Again, whatever they may be. So we come by this very honestly. I've been watching a show on TV uh, lately. I'm, I'm enjoying it, uh, Cosmos. Uh, absolutely. It talks about the universe. Is, it's just it's actually mind-blowing stuff. And the, again, the images are very compelling. But I want us to think back and remember back when we all wore loincloths. And I want us to remember the day we came out of the cave and we saw that dinosaur on the other side. Of the that dinosaur for like two days, right? I might die in the process. I don't know if it's worth the, the expense of energy. I've eaten like five grapes in the last week. I, I could die before I ever catch a stupid thing. Right? So is it worth the expense of, of the limited resources I have? Is it worth the risk? I mean, if I catch it, is it going to turn around and then eat me? Like, that's the other thing. Like, <laughs> maybe my success will be my undoing. And the, th the third thing is I, I might miss an opportunity. If I just stay here by the fire, Bob's going to come back, and he always brings something. Back. Generations throughout all time, it's at a molecular level, and we're always wondering, I've got limited resources, I've got limited opportunities, is this worth the risk? Okay, so that's, those are the value judgments that we're making all the time. Now, I want us to think about companies, corporations. Up until recently, they had a fairly singular focus on the kind of value. So obviously, the value was very much linked to profit. How much profit am I making? And then a guy came along and said, look, I think we're thinking about this a little bit different. Uh, wrongly. In 2000, Jed Emerson, building upon um, popular conversations, uh, maybe by John Elkerton, um, came up with this idea of blended value. And, and basically, John's premise, it was very simple. He just said, you know what, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't believe it has to be an either or. It doesn't have to just be, are we going to make That's the fault. Wow, we make money selling our widgets. Now, this was revolutionary. He he uh, proposed it at the World Economic Forum. People got up and angry, and they left, and they were you know upset. But no, they weren't. Not really. But it, it was. It was important formalization of the thinking and mind, people, profit, planet, that kind of thing. These are all concepts we are very familiar with now, right? I mean, everybody on the call is like, yeah, I know. I didn't know it was called blended value. Maybe, but who doesn't know that these things are not diametrically opposed to each other anymore? I mean, we're, that's the reality we're living in. So along comes Porter and Kramer. And in 2006, they write an article linking... CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, with competitive advantage. Now, competitive advantage is a Michael Porter's brainchild. Actually, a lot of things are Michael Porter's brainchild. But he has a great way of coining competitive advantage that the only value generator in society is business, period. They are the only organization to generate value. So that's a really important consideration. So they write this document. They say, look, if we're going to do CSR right, then it has to connect to competitive.
competitive advantage. Mass tax and strategy about how you do it. And he mentions, he uses a phrase shared value uh, 10 times in the article. And it's a principle. It's a principle of doing CSR right. Right? And that's 2006. In 2011, they write another article. And now creating shared value is a business strategy. It's formalized into a strategic concept. It's no longer a principle of doing CSR right. It's this idea. And they go to the World Economic Forum and they say, you know, it's not either or. We all agree to that and we've had that thought for a decade. But now we need to think about how We do business ourselves. When we think of things like let's generate competitive advantage, and if you wonder where profit comes from, that's where it comes from. Companies that do it well make money. Companies that don't do it well don't make money. But if we look at these two areas, and they're chain, there are places that is beneficial to society and to the company. But it's going to take a mindset. And he goes back to Jed Emerson's original consideration, which is this is more about perspective than anything else, because there are ways to do this. All right. So he, uh, one of the things that Porter suggests are that there are three areas that we need to think through. One is rethinking our markets and our, the way we make products, or the kinds of products we make. Uh, the, the second area is redefining productivity in the value business. And then finally, and the events, obviously, enabling local cluster development. That means no business is an island, right? Like I make dairy products as Nestle, but I need farmers to do that. Mm -hmm. So my business depends on their health. That all makes sense, right? And finally, this is a progression from CS. So, ask some initial questions before we keep going. Um, is there's this idea that I think we all accept that it doesn't have to be either or. There's a way for business to operate that generates value. Porter and Crater would come along and say that the, specifically how we function in our value chain and how we function in, in our competitive advantage, creating customers, selling to customers, we can create value there too. Okay, and remember, value is, is it worth the risk? What about missed opportunities? Um, and is it, is it worth the expense of resources? And they're, they're saying, yeah. Yes. So most companies promise you someone in the business is going to walk down the hall and go, you know, we're, we're all about shared value at this company because we're a responsible company. But where does that leave? Your practice, volunteering, workplace giving. Well, shared value enthusiasts tend to see those as between the work and that's where we're going to go to next. But before we do that, I'm wondering if there are any questions um, that people might have. Yeah, and you actually just kind of, hey, this is Lauren. <laughs> um, you actually just kind of uh, addressed a little bit of one of the questions that, um, that came up, but and, and you might actually, you know, be kind of going, obviously you'll be going into this a little bit more under transformative value, but I, I, what the question is, is, you know, if a company is in that state of shared value, right, so they're in that strategy and that kind of setup, you said that the... There, does it really play a role in in creating the overall shared value strategy of a company. You know what I, do, do you know what I'm Yeah, saying? yeah, that's it. and that's exactly the point we're going to move to next. Okay. Is what is this what is this connection? Is there a connection? Now, I, I need to tell you the folks at the shared value initiative tend towards this philanthropic charitable shared value. Uh, the proposition of this presentation is that is dead wrong and it's okay. dead wrong because culture eats strategy for breakfast. 
I love that statement. <laughs> um, and then I had one question, and I don't know if this is also something that you might be talking about in the next section as well. Um, but one thing that came up for me at the very beginning, you mentioned the concept of sense making, and I was wondering if you were referring to um, the, the pro-social sense making, kind of the research uh, from Adam Grant that's been going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's there's Adam Grant's work. in Europe that have to do with uh, exactly it's a strategic idea but as it flows down through the company most people interpret it in light of their own limited experience which either renders it fairly nonsensical or it's a new version of philanthropy okay yeah gotcha okay makes sense uh, to go ahead and come in because we're going to take another break here in a little bit Okay, here we go. So what is this connection? Um, volunteering and charitable giving uh, or workplace giving are not just philanthropic ideologies or practices. In fact, because we're trying to align them with a focus area in the company or the company's key competencies, and they, we believe they drive business results, and that's a whole different talk about the science behind why this works. Um, we now think we now see them as, as potentially key business to create to fair volunteering and giving. And it's this concept called transformative value. Now, transformative value, think about it. Think about what we do when we take people out and get them involved in the community. Four out of, uh, sorry, three out of four Americans don't volunteer on a regular basis. There's no formal activity for them. See, on a regular basis, while we're very familiar with it and very familiar as a society with the practice of volunteering, um, volunteering is not. I mean, it's not easy. You gotta. There's a police check. There's training. There's this. Uh, so it's not easy to get the volunteer. You're not sure where to volunteer, and if you've never done it before, you're not sure what you want to do. Right. Most people who volunteer for the first time do so because someone asks them. I think it's like 54% or something like that. So all of the advertisements and posters and everything you see at Starbucks or in the work break room, those don't get people through the door. What gets people through the door is someone asking them. And most not folks on this phone, when you're on an elevator and you're talking about the volunteering and giving program or campaign and someone says, wait, we do that here at this company, you want to you want to just hit your head against the wall a whole bunch of times because you think, what do I have to do to let people know that we haven't experienced driving down the road, all of a sudden you see everybody with a Ford Taurus? It's because experience precedes cognitive recognition almost always. So those of us who have the experience of volunteering are more aware of it and receptive to it. Those of us who don't, it's very hard for us to receive these new messages. So let's expand that out a little bit. We have a company that wants to generate value for the society and the company. This is part of our value system, our mission statement, this is who we are, this is what we want to be about. For most of us who don't have any connection with STEM education, let's say, to the school and a project and seeing kids go on and graduate and get great jobs, and they hear the company's going all in on STEM, ta-da, that person is going to be an advocate of it. They're a receptor of it. So what the, a very simple explanation of the connection, and we're going to go further, is that Process through which it remains an external, what we call an external construct. Nine out of ten times will fail because I have no category with which to understand it, no way to empathize with it, and it certainly doesn't align with my value systems. Or maybe more accurately, I can't perceive how it aligns with my personal value systems. So I don't hear the messaging, I don't have an experience with which to uh, align it. 
So the work that we do in providing people opportunities to get involved in the community and have these experiences, create these categories so that we can receive the messaging and then shared value of lines up maps through culture, eating, strategy for breakfast. And you guys, everybody on this call, has the opportunity to ensure that shared value has a wider audience, is received, and is implemented more. This is fine, but that won't do it. What you need is what we call the proximity factor. And that there are two parts to that. One is I have to understand how the task I'm doing through volunteering and giving, and and maybe most importantly through workplace giving, how this actually benefits anybody. How is my stuffing envelopes going to benefit anybody? You need to explain it well. But it, that explanation won't go further unless I have some proximity to the beneficiary. I need the human brain, again, this is that other talk about the science behind it, but the human brain needs to see the face of the person. That I'm a proximity factor can make. You get someone who benefits from the work in front of the group. They do not have to be a great speaker. It has a profound effect on the enthusiasm and the internalization of the motivation to be a participant in those programs, just seeing the person. And if you can't see the person because they're in Africa or somewhere in you know, the Middle East, a video and proximity to the beneficiary. Okay, so transformative value says, look, shared value is great, everything it wants to achieve is great, but it's only going to go so far as the culture will allow it. Culture is limited by the experiences that the, the combined experiences that we all have together. Those experiences determine whether or not I can understand what shared value is and whether or not I believe it is worth my investment, my risk, my time, my resources, personal. You need that in order for shared value to really take root. So Shared value says, look, business goals and stakeholders, that's what we're after. Let's line employees because they are the primary action. We had a survey of 60 uh, studies on strategy. Not one of them mentioned employees as an actor or as an essential part of execution. It's always about senior leadership and managers never about the employees. That's failure. Okay, and that's why we have got nine out of failing, right? The other problem is poor and in fact shared value says employees are either the beneficiaries of shared value because as as communities become better, it's better for employees and where they want to live. One. Two employees are drivers of shared value because employees are demanding companies do more. And thirdly, employees are a source of shared value because if you can go to your HR, which is part of your value chain, right, and lower the costs of um, healthcare costs by providing more benefits or more employees, a source or a driver of shared value. Transformative value posits that they're the primary active in, actor in achieving shared value because they determine the culture of the company. You give them the experience so that they can understand why shared value matters and how it lines up. You can actually see the change that you want to talk really quickly in order to get to the uh, transformative value stage. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I have a few, well, so, okay, first thing, just this is kind of just because most recently the, the, the part of the Prezi that you were just on, uh, when you were talking about how, you know, under shared value kind of employees are almost left out of the equation, right, even though they're such a huge part of a business. Um, and this is really just kind of an opinion, what, what your opinion on it is, but, you know, why do you think that, you know, employees were kind of left out of a, a huge corporate strategy like that. Um, 
when there's such a big identify employees in those three roles. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, beneficiaries, source, and drivers. But um, the reason is is because uh, st strategists, uh, strategic theorists, uh, place a lot. And a strategy and it is that if you cannot get your employees to participate in it in a way that is intrinsically motivated as opposed to it's part of your job just do it um, shared value has built-in limitations which is backed up by the failure rate of most strategies and other observations so it's 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 sort of inherent in the practice as opposed to an, an intentional uh, eclipsing of the of employees as a group. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, that does. Thank you. Yeah. Um, involved in you know actually physically be involved in the opportunity, have the experience, you know, see the see who's benefiting, whether that's through video or having the person be right there. Um, but then you, you kind of had mentioned before that that. Uh, it's, you were kind of talking about how companies, you know, somebody will be in the elevator and say, how do you kind of bridge that experience? Um, you mentioned, you know, talking about being asked to do something as being the best way to, to, to get somebody to come and volunteer for the first time or to get involved for the first time. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you can ask, the company could ask, but I mean, is that... No. Get them there, you know? Yeah. 2% of the people surveyed like three years ago said they ever volunteered at a corporate event because the brand asked them to do mm -hmm. it. And that's the stat that also said 54% said they did so because their colleague asked them to do it. So th there's really no way, it, this is such an experience. Uh, because of empathy. Um, because of uh, empathy kept me caring about my kids when they had a broken leg. I looked after it. That way my gene code didn't die out. Brains that didn't have as much empathy, their kids died and the gene code is gone. So every brain on the planet rewards certain actions because of empathy. Okay, So that's why seeing the face is absolutely critical because that's how we've we've grown as a species over the, you know, the millennia. Um, so Need the voluntary piece, meaning I gotta go. My boss asked me to go. That's the old United Way campaign model, right? Like you've got people at the top saying we're gonna get 100% participation. We're gonna do this, and everybody's like, yeah. That's why the joke is get away from my door. I gave it the office, right? Like I, they got it out of me at the office. It was my choice. Now I don't have a choice. So you gotta get off my front porch. It doesn't matter what your cause is. So the voluntary aspect is what triggers the chemical reaction in the brain. If I have proximity to the person I'm helping. And that chemical reaction, I promise you, this is from, I can remind me after. Chemical reaction is it's high, a runner's high, or sex, right? The, 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 the brain produces these chemicals, and we, th we feel good. Right? We, we feel great. We love it. It's fantastic, which is why we should never do a survey right after a volunteering event because you could ask them, do you like your boss? Yes. Do you like your coworkers? Absolutely. You're just going to like everything, right? You just have more. You're going to get 10 out of 10. Ask them four days later after that's subsided and you'll get a more realistic picture of things. But that's an important consideration. So that that's all part and parcel of why being asked to go by another person in a way that is voluntary will set the brain up to reward the practice. So right. if, we, if you skip any of that, um, you're, you're just not going to get the emotive response that changes attitudes and behaviors. And that's just because that's the way our brains have been designed to work. Right. Well, and So 
could just you know obviously within your employee volunteer program um, in order to achieve that in order to get people you know get more people involved for that first time is you know kind of look through your employee base at who's already doing it and recruit them as ambassadors recruit them as champions and have them you know really be the the individuals going and talking to other people within their departments that they know within the company to recruit them to come volunteer. Because then you get that personal aspect or that personal touch from coming back and getting involved. And then the emails and just letting people know it exists. But um, you know, rather than just doing that, that kind of recruitment of, of champions, if you will, that, that can really go and give that personal touch and that personal invite to the people that they know would be a good kind of strategy, I guess, to kind of bridge that gap. You're 100% correct, Lauren. If you, you cannot do it any other way. Absolutely. You've got to find those champions, collaborate with them, get them on board, and use their existing energy, enthusiasm, and experience to get other people to try it out for the first time. Absolutely. Okay. Um, that we had, which actually you already answered and um, went through that with, you know, well, make it a video or, you know, have one person there instead of, you know, all of them if they're not working directly with the beneficiary. So, all right. So I think we're good to go on to the, on to the five phases. All right. Let's jump in here. So um, there are five phases. Uh, this observation is based on uh, is Joe Pine. He's, uh, he lives in the Twin Cities, a uh, really smart guy. And he basically posits that there have been evolutionary periods in different kinds of economies. So hold on with me. We'll do a little bit of a look back so we can understand uh, where we want to go with this. The first phase is that of commodity, uh, uh, commodities, right? So, you know, Bananas grew in trees and carrots grew in the ground. We picked what we wanted and we, we ate them. These are commodities. This is the way we have been. As a human race, bring those commodities into, you know, I can grow a whole lot of sugar and put it on the shelf of a grocery store and then I can let someone else grow, you know, carrots. So I don't have to do both. I can just do one, and I can make money. I can buy. Uh, exemplified in the goods uh, became abundantly available and transformed the landscape. That was a huge economic shift. Well, then after that, somebody said, well, okay, so I can go to the grocery store, you know, in Mad Men style, and I can buy, you know, carrots and sugar. I don't know what you make with carrots and sugar, but let's throw some potatoes in there, and we, we might have a meal. So we got carrots and sugar and potatoes, and I could go home and make a meal all the time. And someone said, well, what if I put it all together in a Hungry Man meal? So you could sit in front of a brand-newly invented TV and eat. You know, you know I'll make your meal. They It made the commodity service industry. In the United States, at the beginning of the century, century we were, you know, 80% manufacturing, 20% at the most services, and it's completely flipped. In fact, I think it's 90% services and only 10% manufacturing in terms of the GDP of the United States now. Then we went beyond that. Somebody said, I think I could take a cup of You go to work, you go home, that, but now, you know, coffee, a coffee place could be it. So we have Starbucks, and people go to the Starbucks not because of the service necessarily, but because you have the Starbucks experience and all that that is. And I think we understand what we mean by that. Joe Pine posits that the experience, staging experiences for, for customers is a great way to generate effective commitment to your brand, but the best way is to guide transformations and to see the customer as the product. So I'm not just presenting goods or delivering services. I 
business or staging going to a gym, you become the product of going to the gym. Healthcare industry, you're the product of the healthcare industry. Self-help, you're the product of self-help. Um, management consulting, you go through this whole process and you're transformed, you become, your company becomes the product of the process. So customers are the products because you can generate more value as you go along. You got beans, right, one cent to two cent per cup, but then you could turn it into a good, put it in stores for five cents to 25 cents per cup, or you could provide drive-through at Dunkin' Donuts. Now you can charge 75 cents to $1.50 a cup, or you can provide an experience. $2 to $5 a cup. The transformation is the ultimate value generator. And obviously, as we become changed by transformation, there is no evolution in the economies. This is the one we're moving to, or that's what they... Positive bash uh, Harvard Business Review. Okay, so that's the framework that I want to use to help us understand where we are as we think about companies and the evolution of volunteering and giving, because we all didn't start where we are today. There's been this evolution, and where we can assess where are we at in this whole process is we'll ask some questions and you see if it makes sense. The first phase of a company is usually that of collecting. All They realize someone wakes up one day and says, wait a minute, all of our employees are out there doing good things in the community. You know what we need to do? We need to encourage that. So when they walk out the door after work, mind you, or on the weekend, mind you, we'll slap them on the back and say, you know what, at our company, we volunteer, we're fat, we are highly supportive of the work that you're doing at your church or dog pound or whatever. Would you mind sharing some of your stories? We'd like to put it in our CSR report. Okay, it seems to be a benefit that they enjoy. What are other companies doing? You're sort of collecting information and you're collecting stories from the employees. It's like pulling carrots that are growing out of the ground naturally. You just, they're there, let's use them, right? The goal here is positive publicity. but probably a community, okay? So we're assessing the goodwill of our stakeholders. So that's collecting. That's a collecting phase. You might move past that, and you're in the organizing phase. In the organizing phase, the main action here is managing people. So you're not just collecting information about people. You're, you're like, well, wait, whoa, people are volunteering all over the place. Some people are, like, digging ditches and planting flowers. Other people are building houses. What in the world is going on? Some people are volunteering at the church. Do we even support church Sunday school as a company? Like, is that what we're doing? You know what we need? We need to manage this process a little bit. Okay. and developing our corporate resource. We see that it's a resource. We've got some good information. Now we're trying to develop that corporate or resource, so we're organizing ourselves. Then you may go a little further, and you're like, well, okay, so now we've got a policy in place. We kind of know what people are doing, so wouldn't it be good if people did more? So we're in the office. Maybe we could meet in a region per year. So we end up planning events, providing tools, toolkits, guidelines, policies, videos, way to submit your stories, but it is all around these events. And we're proactively delivering and offering these events. The goal here, more participation. Now, some people get confused and think it's about higher level of engagement. It's not really at this point. We want people to show up. We want them to participate because our goal is we want people to get a sense of belonging. We want some alignment with what we do with the brand. So we might kind of nudge. The fourth phase is that of engaging. So now we've had a few big events and we're starting to think, wait, can we go a little further with this? Can we get more? 
maybe it needs to be a bit more engaging. So the idea is here is one of collaboration, and we begin to understand that there, are, as you said, Lauren, there are people out there who are champions, and there are people out there who've never volunteered in their life. So how do we meet people at their highest level of contribution without them feeling coerced and made to do it? How do we meet them at their highest level of contribution around what they're interested in? Maybe it's skill-based. How do we collaborate with people so we can engage people audiences to meet people at their highest level of contribution because we want people to be more effective in their present roles? Now we're like, okay, when they do well at volunteering, they do well in their team at work. When they lead a project that they're learning new skills, they bring that back to work. Let's get on engagement, okay? So all the way now to the last phase is one of transforming. Now, transforming moves past meeting people at the highest level of contribution, which is absolutely essential, and it is a precursor to the stage before it, as each one has been. You can't skip one of these stages. Nobody starts out at engaging. You've got to go through this progression. But here, now, the action is one of guiding. We've got a sense of our missile organization. Remember, now we found our champions, and we see some robust abilities, energies, enthusiasm, experience, and we want to focus it and guide it and create impact not only for the community and the business, but for the employees. And so have a chance to meet person, and if their brand is aligned with it and supporting it, there's a sense of purpose and autonomy that's brought into the workplace, even a sense of mastery when we build all these things together, and we start living at a completely different level of life. You do not help I'll forget about it who we are. This is how transformation occurs. You have this experience that has depth and meaning over a period of time and your attitudes and behaviors shape and you begin to live out of that better version of who you are. And our companies become full of people who when they hear that we are now going to reduce the carbon footprint, it is not just blah, 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 the latest phase, fad. It is, oh my gosh, I know what that means to me. I know that what that means to the people that I volunteer with. And that matters. This is where we find the leadership to shape the future. This is the potential. Blend value. Corporate America as we know it today into something that we didn't dream possible just 20 years ago. So, in summary, in the collecting phase, the focus is investigation. And here the basic question that you may be asking is, what in the world is going on out there? What is everybody doing? Let's figure that phase, the focus on what should we be doing it? Yeah, like there's some stuff going on that I don't know if that's who we are as a brand. The third phase is one of offering. And here we're, we're, the focus is activities, right? And we're asking, this is about what we should do. Now we're taking some intentional, proactive steps to say this is who we are and this is what we do and we organize those activities. Fourth phase, if you remember, is engaging. And here the focus is motivation. Why will people participate? How do we meet them at their highest level of contribution? Why do we do it as a company? And our messaging becomes clear because I promise we need to work, there's no stopping them. And then finally transforming. The final and ultimate phase here, the focus is development. This is about who we're becoming as a group. This is about what tribal leadership talks about, that fourth and fifth stage. When you move together and you no longer say, I'm better than that person or we're better than that group, but We're enough of people much of the time that we've got culture shift and those strategies find the roots and deliver the promise that they hold for all of us for a better tomorrow. So any questions? Because uh, I know we're near the end of our time. Wonderful. Thanks so 
much, Chris. Um, it's, so I, I happen to be a, um, I was a psych major in college, and I'm kind of an, I love evolutionary psychology, and so all of this is just super nerdy awesome to me. I love it. <laughs> um, about do, does each phase live independently or are you really kind of building on top of each other? So now you said that you, I mean obviously you have to move through all five phases, but you know even at the very top end in the you know in the transforming phase or, um, you're still going to be also collecting data. as you're moving through or? Yeah, that's a great question. So two things. One, it's not completely linear. Companies are complex, multi-division, all over the world, different regions, and how it works out in the United States is going to be a lot different than Slovakia. So this is not meant to be a linear expression. It's a sort of a simplified framework. So we can kind of say, oh, I can kind of see what we're doing here is we're in we're solidly in the collecting phase, but over here we seem to be more organizing, and it gives you a sense of what's coming next. Having said that, as you as we move forward to these phases, we exactly right trying to figure out like what is actually going on and have we captured everything and does is our policy accurate do we need to revise it because we still want to organize the actions of people and make sure that we're on point so as you move forward you bring that previous it's not like that gets dumped you you bring now we are now we need to meet people at the highest level of contribution, and, and we, your language tends to change too as an organization. And I, I would expect most people on this phone, uh, on this webinar, have experienced this evolution of perspective and language that is similar to what we've outlined. But that is a great observation, Lauren. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the next question is kind of about the is, is a balance question, right? So. When we're talking about, you know, there's all of this, there's lots of research and lots of people talking about, you know, the link between um, in impact and business success and strategic volunteering, right? So really aligning, you know, your community involvement programs, whether that's, you know, philanthropy or, you know, or volunteering with your company's core business so that you're, you're, you know, not only listening to the needs of the community, but you're also delivering what you're best at, right? So is there is there a balance between being strategic and engaging all passions? You know what I mean? Because you know we're talking about you have to ask somebody to get involved in order for them to get involved and have the experience. Okay, so, yeah. so then they have the experience. Is it is it really the goal to kind of shift their values to align with the values of the company, or is it? a balance between the two. No, it's not it's not a balance. <laughs> we said a uh, and I'm it's I know you love puppies, but that's not who we are, so good luck with that. And we need you on board for water. That there's no way that that's gonna work. Right? So it, it's less about um balance and much more, and this is maybe actually what you mean by balance, but we talk about a both end rather than either or. So when we find those champions, all of who are champions because they were doing something else somewhere else, you can't kick that to the curb because then we won't get the effect we want which results in effective commitment. Um, and, that, and that's the highest level of commitment out of three types of commitment. So what you need to do is we, you need to find a way to be inclusive of almost everything. Obviously, you may not want to do the Boy Scouts or Sunday School, right? So there's extremes. But you're inclusive of almost everything to say, look, what you believe in and what you're about matters to us. Um, Support you and what you're doing, 
as best we can be about water because true champions, and there are three stages in the journey of a volunteer, and that's a whole other conversation, but true champions believe that every one of their colleagues should have this thing that they've discovered that they just love. They don't volunteer. I mean, they feel obligated to show up sometimes, but they're, they're making this investment because they have high levels of intrinsic motivation and completely believe in it, and they think everybody should live this way. It's fantastic. So you give them the opportunity, and I swear to you, we've never had a champion turn us down. When we say... And we work with a, your colleagues active in this where we create some real impact. And by the way, this is why we're doing it and this is what we want to achieve. The answer is always, absolutely, what do you want me to do? Like, without exception, absolutely, what do you want me to do? But, but if we went in and said, you know, position, posture, ourselves, you know, that it's just it's a human experience. It's never going to work. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, so thank you. Now, so the next question that came in is about kind of the steps to getting to a point where you're even ready to start down this road of, of transformative value, right? So the question was, if a company hasn't adopted or, or put in place a shared value strategy, um, can they still just go straight into, you know, evolving their transform it or getting to transformative value or uh, yeah. or where are we in different parts of the world in this process? What would it take to move from organizing to offering? Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty simple. Like you'd have to be intentional about what you want to offer, but you have to first figure out what are we doing and collect that info and whatnot. So so there's that part, but if if your company hasn't even heard of shared value, they probably heard of CSR done right, right? It's on a continuum. So if your company has at all has a, a platform around corporate social responsibility or corporate responsibility, this is how you change the culture so that strategy becomes effective. If this isn't happening, that strategy will only take root in those who already have the experience, like the one out of four Americans, uh, and it will be very limited because it will be co a competing interest. It will remain external. So that strategy will only be a success. and obligate them to different decision. Like BP, for example. I, I'll give you this example. BP had a huge oil spill. A thousand scientists, just a little over a thousand scientists, shortly thereafter said, look, can we help you? We've got great ideas for what you can do and how to avoid this catastrophe that you had with Halliburton. We'll We'll put they came back a number of months later, said, here we are, we, we will even help you work through these. And BP said, you know, you know what, we're kind of busy. And that was it. No return phone calls, nothing. Just turn them down flat. Since then, they've had a series of spills. But the reason, those, the reason there's such a disconnect between, oh, don't worry, we won't do it again, we're not that kind of company, and the individuals who make the choice is because it's external to their value systems. It's the people who are answering those calls, making those choices, are not the people who are driven by, you know what, I know a family on the... It's absolutely essential to the success of these strategies overall, but it doesn't have to just be shared value. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so we are kind of bumping up against the edge of the hour here. So um, if you could go ahead and change the presenter back to me so I can take us through just a few closing reminders. And then... We will... So let's see. It should be in the... Screen sharing. Wait. I got it, I got it. it change for, oh, there we go, perfect. Okay. So, all right. There you are. All right, perfect. 
show. Sorry, everybody, get to get this pulled back up here. All right. So um, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us this morning. Um, really interesting conversation, really interesting and thought-provoking material. And I'm actually really excited to kind of continue to review it a little bit more and get a better understanding. Get to stay informed with Volunteer Match. Um, you can join us on our blog, volunteering at CSR.org, on Twitter at VM underscore solutions, and you can sign up for our monthly Good Companies newsletter, which you can also do um, on the blog or on solutions.volunteermatch.org. Um, and last but certainly not least, when I and Kay Morgan Curtis, who runs um, the employee volunteering programs at New Old Rubbermaid, and they'll be talking about um, virtual volunteering, which we see as an untapped resource for um, continued employee engagement. So um, don't forget to join us for that one. And just to wrap us up, thank you again, Chris. Um, wonderful presentation this morning and wonderful topic. And again, thank you to our friends at Charities at Work um, for helping us to set up this webinar this morning. And we will see you guys next month. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All this right, is great. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.